Hello, um, can everyone hear me I guess? Seems to project the sound a bit this room obviously. Uh, my name's Mike Bowen. Um, I am a... Oh Christ. I am a... Cool. There we go. Uh, about me, I'm a software developer at Biobox. I work with Sakis and Kevin actually. Um, I am a .NET developer by day. But um, in my spare time, I like looking at other programming languages because I'm a bit of a nerd, um, as you might be able to tell. Um, I'm going to talk about one of these programming languages today, which is Elixir, which you may or may not heard of. Um, you're probably thinking, yet another programming language. Um, I think programming language fatigue is kind of real. You know, there's so many things to learn nowadays. Why would you want to spend yet more time learning yet another programming language. I think there's a fair amount of languages out nowadays which aim to solve a lot of the problems we have with doing sort of concurrent distributed computing. Um, things like Go, uh, Rust, Node.js, and Elixir is another one of them. But again, why would you want to waste your time learning Elixir? Why would you not just stick with C Sharp? Um, why would you not try and learn Go, for example? So I'm going to try and convince you to give Elixir a go. Um, but before I do that, let's just sort of describe Elixir a bit. Um, so it was first released 11 years ago. It's open source. Uh, the current version was released just 14 days ago. Um, releases are usually, at least minor versions, are usually coincide with um, this thing here, the Erlang OT OTP platform, uh, which is the system it runs on. Uh, and two of the main sorts of things about it is that it's designed to be highly extensible as a language and the tooling is incredibly productive. Um, so just to discuss the language a bit more, um, it has a very sort of superficial syntactical resemblance to Ruby, uh, use of white space, same kind of keywords, but it's functional. It's not object orientated, it's not imperative, it's more of a functional language, i.e. it has immutable data structures. So all of the built-in data structures such as lists, maps, structs, if you do any operations on them, it will return a new version of that data rather than modify it in memory, which is cool because that helps with concurrency. Uh, it has extensive usage of pattern matching Pretty much everything in Elixir is a pattern match, which is essentially almost like a souped up case. You're matching on the shape of data in some form. Um, even assignments, even just X equal one, that's actually a pattern match in Elixir. It's a bit weird, but it's cool. Uh, we have first class functions. Um, so you can build functions out of arbitrary statements. Um, and there's a, a Lambda like syntax as well. Comprehensions are pretty cool. They're like sugar over uh, quite a few of the sort of common uh, list functions or numerable functions. Uh, kind of looks a bit like link. Uh, it's kind of kind of a bit of a resemblance to link there. Um, most controversially, it is dynamic. Um, so operations and types are resolved at runtime. So we have duct typing, um, but there are ways to make it a bit safer, which we'll talk about shortly. And it treats metaprogramming as a first class citizen i.e. the whole language is built on top of these sort of APIs that are available to you. So even things like if statements, they're not actually statements, they're actually methods. And they're actually not even methods, they're macros, believe it or not. Um, which you don't really have to be aware of, but it's pretty cool, the flexibility you get with it. Um, other things, it's got really excellent support for strings and other binary data. Um, there's a I think it's kind of famous article about how the string type is inherently broken, um, at least with uh, Unicode support uh, for UTF-8. Um, let me just find the name of the chap who wrote it. Oops, let's not do that. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce his name. Uh, Max aren't very good at doing presentations. I don't know if anyone knows that. You know, it's really hard to have a look at your notes. Uh, 
There we go, Edeque uh, Motorway. Um, who wrote this article about how string type is actually fundamentally broken, again, in most sorts of mainstream languages, JavaScript, C-sharp, Java. Um, Elixir, on the other hand, has really excellent support for strings and binary data. Um, it handles all sorts of edge cases when dealing with UTF-8, which is pretty cool. Um, we have what I would term gradual typing. Um, so even though it's a dynamic language, um, you do have the option to sort of define things called type specs, which are basically function signatures, which again is a pretty cool feature, and that also ties in with the tooling, so you can get sort of some nifty code analysis, code analysis rather. Um, behaviors uh, analogous to interfaces in .NET, um, they define a set of function signatures, any module you create can implement them, but it just has to implement all of the actual uh, functions in there. Uh, polymorphism, which is a word I hate, because what the hell does it mean? Um, are supported by, is supported by protocols, which again are like almost mini interfaces, and uh, sigils, which are used to represent data structures as text. So you can kind of do like literal regexes or literal URLs or anything like that. Am I on the right? Right, it's time for our first um, code sample. So let me just get me bearings because this is going to be interesting. Awesome. Okay. Um, so I've just did some really noddy code in Elixir just to kind of demonstrate it. Uh, again, this is not very good, but you know it's just kind of really noddy just to show you the syntax. Um, so right at the very top, um, you can see we're defining a module, def module. Oops, let's not do that. Called music provider. And you can see in here, there's this little callback, get artists. This is one of these behaviors I was talking about. It's basically the definition of a function signature. So function name, get artists, and these two colons represent what it should return, which is a tuple, which again is a very common pattern in functional kind of programming languages. An OK and term, which basically means whatever you want. Any type will do. <coughs> Further down, we have this actual concrete definition, if you like, called music. Uh, we say we implement the music provider behavior here. We have what you'd probably call, I guess, a constant C-sharp, I guess. Um, this is basically some compile time data, which will be encoded into the bean bytecode. Uh, it can't be altered at runtime, but it certainly can be read. And here, we just have a very simple uh, function implementation so we just create a list of artists, uh, add a couple of new artists to it on the next line using the double plus operator, and then return a tuple which says, OK, yeah, that succeeded with the artists. Uh, our next couple of blocks here are a bit more interesting. Um, sorry, well, these two functions here are a bit more interesting. As you can see, they both got the same name. Um, they've both got the same signature, they both take an artist. Um, so how does resolution work with these? Well, if you call rate artist, what actually happens? Elixir, again, with pattern matching, has a concept of uh, guards. Um, you'll see them all the time in actual pattern matching statements as well. Um, but on the actual end of the function signature here, you can see there's a when artist equal the fire references do. Now, it's not uncommon that you would have a load of the same functions, all of the same name, and actually have different sort of pattern matches on there. Again, when a function's actually called, it's not necessarily the type of the data that matters. It matters if it actually matches the structure in the signature, which is a bit of a complicated scenario to get, but that's kind of an inkling. Um, so you can see down here, further on, uh, you can see we're doing a bit of destruction here on music dot get artists. Uh, you can see even further down here, we're actually doing a bit of pattern matching itself. Say if that function returns uh, data in that structure, just return artists. If it returns anything else, return a tuple of a single element with error in. Um, and now we've just got another bit of a function there, call. And here's one of these things we call a comprehension. So basically it's saying, for artists and artists, where it's not craft work, do this, essentially. Um, 
just out of note, you can see this do is separated by a comma and then it's got a colon. Whereas in other cases, it's like an actual do end block, almost like in Ruby. Again, everything's kind of implemented as a function in Elixir. It's almost like a lisp essentially, um, without the brackets. But and instead of actual sort of building up brackets and brackets of stuff, you build you are still building up lists, essentially. So do is actually a parameter to a function called well, this list comprehension. So yeah, um, what I'm going to do now is oh, not that one. Am I in the right directory? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so I've just run a little tool called IEX, which is basically kind of similar to IRB. Um, it just run this little Elixir script I've got. Um, it's also just broke on there, as in the breakpoint, if you like. Um, so I can actually just start evaluating the, uh, the variables that they are currently. So you can see I've done rated there do artists and get them back but I wanted to discuss uh, the sigils as well actually because I thought they were pretty cool so if I import my module cool so if I just import this module here which you see you've got these two following functions in uh, one called sigil f that means I can run this bit of code And I should get, yeah, awesome. So, sigils are essentially kind of like shorthand functions. You see it's got a tilde F. Again, tilde R would represent a literal regular expression. Tilde F, which I've just created, represents basically a path to a file. And it comes back with the actual file, con uh, file content. It's pretty noddy again, but it's just a little sort of taster of how extensible the actual language is. Cool, okay. So that's the first sample done. Great. Um, <clears throat> so I really like Elixir as a language. I think it's got an awful lot of really nice things in. I would implore people to have a look at it itself. There's a lot more than what even I've just talked about. Um, but that's without discussing the actual platform it runs on, which is this thing called the OTP, or the Open Telecom Platform, which is a misnomer, essentially. It's, it, it dates back to when this thing, Erlang, and the Erlang runtime actually came about, which was 33 years ago, do you believe? It was initially developed by Ericsson uh, to develop telephone switches. Um, so telephone switches connect calls, essentially. So obviously you ring someone, goes to a telephone switch, and it'll be connected to whoever you're trying to ring. Now, telephone switches, um, well, they need to be able to scale to hundreds of calls, perhaps thousands. Um, they need to be able to be fault tolerant if for some reason the telephone switch goes down we need to be able to go to another telephone switch without any calls being disconnected uh, they need to be distributed over an entire network um, and yeah I think that's about it really for the requirements um, let's just have a look yeah um, so Erlang, oh, so Ericsson developed this, this language called Erlang, Ericsson language, and this uh, library and runtime. Um, and this is what Elixir runs on essentially as well. Um, Elixir again is not too old compared to Erlang, but the idea is, is that we've got this really cool framework which is battle tested. I mean, how many times have you ever had a telephone go down, a telephone call actually go down? or ever even notice it. It's, you know, it's incredibly mature for what it is. Oops. Um, and yeah, it's, it's stable. So we get the sort of benefits of a really nice language, modern, fully productive, uh, on a, a, a framework which is basically battle tested. So essentially it's ideal for long running non-stop systems. Uh, soft real-time, i.e. if a bit of a technical thing that I guess, but if there's any missed deadlines it's not an actual critical failure, whereas if it was like a jet plane or something then yeah that would probably be a critical failure because the jet plane might blow up I guess. Um, scalable, it's distributed, concurrent and fault tolerant. 
So, I mean, I don't know about you, but that kind of describes a lot of the systems I'm involved with, with building pretty much every day. Um, so it's ideal for these kind of things, chat servers, game servers, websites even, uh, even just down to sort of general purpose scripting. So there's a point there, why not use Erlang instead of why would you use Elixir? Again, Erlang's 33 years old. It's a horrible language, it's really ugly. That's pretty much all I've got to say about that. It's not very productive. Um, some people might disagree, but you're wrong. Uh, Elixir's just <laughs> generally a lot nicer, um, you know. And I'm a big Ruby fan at heart, so you know, superficially that makes me feel better. Um, so, how do Elixir and this OTP thing help actually developing these kind of scalable, concurrent, fault-tolerant, distributed applications? Um, well, Elixir kind of wraps an awful lot of the uh, libraries in the OTP in a way Erlang doesn't. He didn't like the talk, did he? <laughs> <laughs> that Erlang fan. Um, no, sorry. Um, so, um, I digress. Elixir wraps an awful lot of the primitives and kind of, well, wraps an awful lot of the functionality of the OTP in its own primitives and sort of first class modules, if you like, in a way Erlang doesn't. Uh, namely in these things called processors, which are our main unit of con con concurrency, rather. Um, the not operating system processors got nothing to do with them kind of processors. Um, you can create as many as you want. Uh, up to 134 million, apparently. I've never actually tried that. That's everyone's homework. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it's typical to have many at one at one time. You can link processes together. So if one process happened to crash, you would actually get this crash propagated through. Uh, but saying that, they are actually isolated in memory uh, and they only communicate by passing messages to one another. Uh, which follows this kind of uh, paradigm called the actor programming model. Has anyone ever used ACA.net? Yeah. You should be giving this talk. <laughs> Please don't correct me if any of this is wrong, by the way. <laughs> um, so that brings us on to the next thing. How do we actually manage state within this? Because this is always a thing I struggle with in functional languages. You know, I just want to store a field or some bit of state in it. I'm not really fussed about purity. It's actually pretty easy in Elixir. Um, we have a variety of sort of modules that help with that. Um, for very sort of simple scenarios, we can just have a, a loop within a process that we create, which just keeps receiving messages over and over again until infinity, or someone crashes it. Uh, we have tasks which are a step up from looping processes. Then we have agents, which are a step up from tasks. And each one's a bit more abstracted and you get a bit more functionality out of it until we have these things called generic servers or gen servers, um, which are pretty much your sort of bread and butter in Elixir. These are the actual things that do things. So uh, gen server is a specialized process which implements the relationship of a client-server relationship. When we say client-server, we're not talking about HTTP or anything like that. We're talking purely between the server is this Elixir process, the client is this other bit of Elixir, this other process which is trying to do stuff with this process. Essentially, to define how state is created, retrieved, updated, destroyed, which I do believe is CRUD, I think. Um, the common functionality for tracing and error reporting and they support synchronous and asynchronous operations. And the main draw of them uh, between tasks and agents and other things is that they can be supervised, um, which basically means if they crash for some reason, i.e. your code's rubbish, which hands up, that's always the case, or you, the hardware goes down, or some other little reason, I don't know, somebody's done an update in the computer, a supervisor will look at that process and go, hey, look, that's gone down, let's restart it. So there's your fault tolerance, okay? And again, if you have these processes distributed across a wide range of nodes, as it is in Elixir, then you're going to get a fair amount of uptime, almost 99% since in some cases that I've read. 
um, with various little things uh, happening. Um, again, because there's an awful lot of things we don't control, you know, databases, IO, networks, things are gonna crash and you know, you can't just keep wrapping try catch around it because that's not gonna solve anything. You're not actually dealing with the underlying program, uh, problem. Using supervisors, at least you have a strategy for actually recreating things if they do go wrong, because they will go wrong. Uh, so in the next day, it's actually really frowned upon to actually use any sort of try-catch kind of paradigm. You let errors happen, as long as you have a strategy for resolving them errors and you know, restoring some sort of natural state, or neutral state rather. And to get really complicated, supervisors can supervise other supervisors, uh, or I could just say supervision trees. So you can have a network of all these nodes, all these processes, have a variety of workers, a bunch of supervisors above them, and a bunch of supervisors above them. <laughs> so yeah. But I just wanted to make a point. So in .NET, for example, uh, if you use system.io to get a file, you get a file object back. Underneath all that abstraction, there's some kind of file handle. You know, it points to an actual unmanaged resource i.e. you need to dispose of that resource, otherwise you're going to get a memory lock or something. Something horrible is going to happen. You know, if somebody tries to open that file later on, it's going to blow up in their face. Probably not as dramatic. In Elixir, processes really are the bread and butter of things. If you try and open a file in Elixir, you don't get some sort of abstraction re representing the file, you just get a process back. Well, actually, you get an ID back. If you want to write to a file, you send a message saying write to a process and that will handle all the sort of file handling business. And if that process crashes, because I don't know, if the file's on the network and it, the network goes, the process will clean up after itself. So just to demonstrate that, we've got another example. Cool. Um, so just a bit of noddy code again. Uh, this function up here, spawn, sounds horrible, uh, that creates a process, um, takes a delegate or anonymous function, whatever you want to call it. Uh, receive is another function that's built in, uh, it's saying receive a message, just keep receiving messages. Uh, once you've got that message, we're just going to essentially inspect it. Now, since we've got the process ID from down here, we're actually going to use the I.O. module to send a write message to that process. Obviously this won't work, but I'm just trying to demonstrate that. Essentially all you're doing, even for sort of I.O. intensive operations, is sending messages. You're working at a real kind of high level of abstraction at this point. It's not you're getting a file handle back or some naughty little object which represents a database connection. You're just dealing with processes. Whew. So let me try and run that. Um, yeah. Cool. Awesome. So uh, ignore the horrible crash because that's fine. Uh, but you can see here the actual message that is sent across using that io.write is being sort of dumped here. You can see we've got the process ID of the actual process that sent it and uh, what's actually data has been sent across to write to the file. Um, right, yeah, finally as well, um, Elixir can be distributed. Um, so we have a concept of a thing called Erlang nodes or Elixir nodes. Basically, it's just a, a separate Elixir runtime. Um, they can run, you can run as many as you want on the same computer, uh, same LAN or another machine on the network, what have you. Um, but they basically provide the mechanism for spreading your processes across uh, the network for load balancing or in more advanced scenarios, uh, fall over, not fail over, fail over, yeah, and take over. So if one node goes down, another node will come back up to run the actual process for you. Uh, yeah, an application is configured to run over separate Erlang nodes, which I'm going to show to you in a minute. Um, processes are location transparent, which 
is a bit of a phrase, but essentially that means even if a process is running on a machine somewhere else, as long as you have the idea of that process, you can just send a message to it. You, there's no other sort of ceremony involved with that. Um, so, oh God. No. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Um, so essentially, I said at the beginning of the talk, which seems like hours ago now, um, you know, we're interested in applications um, that are concurrent, which scale rail, which are fault tolerant, and that we can distribute. And this is just to summarize how Elixir and the OTP provides that. We have processes for concurrency and scalability. We have supervision trees for fault tolerance. Uh, Erlang nodes, again, for failover and takeovers. And again, for distribution, we use Erlang nodes again. Cool, and here's our last sample of the day. No one cheered. <laughs> um, so complete. Um, I actually didn't write this code. <laughs> so if it doesn't work, it's not my fault. Um, but it's a good demonstration of all the, the things I, I've, I've spoken about um, in a way that's not too abstract, I guess. So we have this naughty little application which if you send it a request, it'll give you a Chuck Norris joke. I didn't write this, by the way. Um, so essentially, uh, we have this application called Chucky. Um, it has this start method, which takes in this type. And you can see here, it does a switch on that. So if it's a normal kind of startup, it just does a little bit of login information. Or if it's a takeover or failover, it also does a bit of logging information. But the point is, we import this supervisor here. Then we define this children array, or list rather, and we say our worker is called chucky.server, which references another file, which I'll go over in a minute. And down here, um, we have this supervisor start link. So all we're doing here is actually starting a supervisor with this gen server called chucky.server. Uh, we're defining here the actual strategy for when it crashes, because we will crash it now, uh, which is one for one, which means if one process dies, uh, don't kill the rest, just resurrect the one that's dead. Because you might have various strategies for dealing with when things go down. And we have a little entry point there, which just returns chucky.server.fact. So let's have a look at server. This is our gen server imp implementation. Uh, we have a method called start link, which defines how to start the actual gen server. This uses the name of the current module to register it within Elixir, or the runtime rather. We have a, a method called fact, or a function called fact, which sends a fact message to a gen server of the name of this module, which is chucky.server. And then we have these call box down here. So these handle what happens when a gen server is created and when it receives a call or a message called fact. So first of all, our init call just does seed some, well, just a, sets the, the random seed using the current OS timestamp. Then we get a list of facts, which is just a plain text file with a load of Chuck Norris jokes. Who the hell actually wrote all this out, by the way? <laughs> actually, you know his name because I, I reference it at the end, but seriously. God almighty. Anyway, uh, we split on them, just getting a list of facts or whatever, and we return a tuple, OK, facts. Now, because of how gen servers work, this facts object, well, this facts list, rather, will be stored in some kind of session state, if you like. It gets a bit more technical, but I don't want to bore you too much. Um, so when we actually do, do this handle call, we just say facts as part of the parameters passed in, and well, hey, we, we get that back from wherever the hell it's actually being stored. And then we use this bit of um, pipeline operator to uh, pass it into shuffle to get a random one, and then reply or return a reply message. So <laughs> actually, actually see this in action. Now, the thing about this one is, this application is it is distributed. So we've got some configuration for three different nodes, A, B, and C, okay? 
Now, this is where it could all go horribly wrong. As you can see here on my terminal, I have got three splits. And using this <coughs> IEX thing, I'm going to start node A, node B, node C. Okay? And this is when it all goes terrible. Okay. So now we have three Elixir nodes running, or Erlang nodes running. Now if I type into, oh yeah, I can do it there. If I type into ixchucky.fact, is it? There we go. Well, hey, I get some stupid joke back. Again, that could be a <laughs> HTTP API or what have you. It doesn't necessarily need to be a command line thing. Most interesting thing will happen is if I kill node A. Now, what should happen is that node B will go, oh, sh shoot, uh, node A's gone down. We need to pick up the slack. So let's do that. Okay. Give it a second. <laughs> well, hey, there we go. <laughs> so as you can see by this little message that's been uh, uh, printed out, um, application has started on B, at, uh, which is just my host name. So now the application is actually running on node B. Again, if you did the same thing and killed that, it will now fall over or fail over, whatever you want to say, to node C. And there we go. So I mean, that was, that's pretty dead easy to set up, even just on a local machine to actually get it spread across these nodes. Again, it's actually really easy to get it set up across and um, distributed machines as well, as long as you have the host name and you know, that actually resolves to something, you're actually pretty, pretty safe really. It's, um, again, we could take this further and we could actually um, load balance it across the nodes rather than just actually using them as failovers. But um, the guy hadn't, wrote that in the hadn't written that in the code and I wasn't really willing to write it myself. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's actually the truth. No, um, I, didn't, I didn't really have much time for that one, um, but yes. Cool, okay, so I'm just gonna finish off now just with a couple of things just about the tooling. Um, so like I've discussed, and like you've seen, IEX is Interactive Elixir. You can use it to run scripts, uh, projects, commands, what have you. You can also browse documentation on it, which is actually pretty cool. The documentation for Elixir is really good. So if I just do this, and if I type in help uh, list dot no, no, enum, not shovel. There you go. It's quite nice, the documentation you get. Um, you can also connect the nodes on there and all that kind of, kind of stuff. Um, Mix is uh, your sort of standard project management tool. Um, and not really much else to say about that. It'll run unit tests and all that kind of crap. Uh, Hex is your dependency management, which is kind of similar to NuGet. Uh, Dial Dialyzer is your code analysis tool. So if you've used type specs or behaviors, this will be able to go through your Elixir code, which is dynamic and go, hey, look, this looks like it's dead code or this looks like a, a type violation or what have you. And we also have others for testing concurrency, uh, viewing the airline runtime, which I can actually just do, I think. Is it that? Of course it would run on my other one. Give me a sec. <coughs> there we go. So it doesn't look nice because I'm using the dark theme and no one's updated it yet. But again, it's kind of like a little task manager view for actually inspecting the Elixir runtime. I think if I click on Elixir, double click, should come back eventually with the actual supervision tree for Elixir itself, because Elixir is just an Erlang application. <coughs> Was it IEX? Yeah, whatever. And there's a variety of frameworks available. Uh, Phoenix, which is the sort of de facto website creation thing. Uh, I think it just follows MVC. Ecto for databases. Nerves for embedded systems and <coughs> XUnit for unit testing. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions apart from why and when are you going home? <laughs>
He's not a fan. Jeez. Go on, sorry. Uh, are there any particular plugins you use for VS Code to make it play nicely? Or does it work natively? Actually, there's, um, there's a whole... I think there's an actual service thing called Alchemist. Um, I tend to use Vim because I'm a bad person. Um, I don't really like VS Code. Um, but it, it runs kind of well in VS Code, I guess. Alchemist seems to help things. I think it's got symbol definition. Doesn't seem the documentation browser doesn't seem to work at all. But I can't say I've used it with any sort of anger. Um, so basically, you use Vim, you know. Can't get out of it. Sorry. Can't get out of it. <laughs> um, yeah. Any, anybody else? You didn't give it to them of the online updates. Sorry. You didn't give it to them of the online updates. You can do real-time online updates. I know, um, because, <laughs> so in Elixir is a kind of a functionality to do hot code swapping, where you can deploy updated versions of modules, uh, again, with any sort of, without any kind of downtime, because again, you've got to think of its sort of genesis and telephone switches, which, you know, you can't really have any sort of downtime of that. Um, but yes, you're quite right, I didn't demo that. I'm sorry. Just to show you how powerful the OTP system is, WhatsApp was actually written by 10 software engineers for billions of users, and, and they reckon that if they'd used anything else, they wouldn't have been able to do it. So 10 engineers wrote their back end and they supported it as well. So yeah, I should have led with that. That would have been a lot more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's seriously powerful. Um, I can't say I'm brilliant since also distributed program or anything like that but I find it really simple to use personally um, the language itself is lovely and the actual library itself well I don't think there's much you can really say about it other than it's really cool so yeah anybody else oh awesome Um, sorry, just a bit of further reading if anyone is actually interested. Um, a lot of this talk is based off the Little Elixir and OTP guidebook. Uh, he's the guy who did the Chuck Norris thing. So, uh, Elixir Cohen's is like a short kind of um, exercise based thing to actually get used to the syntax of Elixir. It's really cool, give it a go. And of course, the Elixir website's got all the documentation and all that kind of stuff on it. So, yeah, you can keep clapping. <laughs> okay.